Good morning. We could be in for a long one today. I uh, haven't even started yet, and I'm already... Um, Jeff, I appreciate the the uh, the word that you brought there this morning. You know it's bad when you don't even know exactly why you're crying. <laughs> my mom's back there going. <laughs> if you know my mom, sun pops out and she cries and drives by the Culver sign and she cries. And <laughs> no rhyme or reason. It's just uh, overactive tear ducts. So... Uh, this morning we're talking about, um, we're going to start, you know, we started uh, the year talking about new vision, kind of doing work with the Lord and, and uh, I hope you came here this morning with your hearts ready to see breakthrough in your life, regardless of where you are at with the Lord, regardless of of um, what you think you've done or not done, or uh, where you've come from, uh, breakthrough. Uh, we need breakthrough in our lives, and I hope that uh, hope that you've been doing work with the Lord. I hope that you've been uh, putting in the work, doing business with the Lord. Uh, Bringing our hearts and lives back into uh, alignment with His, with His Spirit and His Word, and and uh, we just finished looking at the Book of Haggai again, and where God is calling His people, refocusing His people, bringing them back uh, to uh, true worship, getting their priorities straight, and uh, some of you might still be in uh, that process of doing work with the Lord. Uh, we. Spent kind of three Sundays, 21 days, um, looking at the book of Haggai and hopefully doing that. And I, uh, but uh, I am I am not naive enough to think that uh, that that sometimes the work that we're doing, the the work the Lord has for us, the the things He's doing in our lives, um, is uh, is is quick like that. Uh, sometimes it takes much longer. And so, uh, if you're still doing the work, keep working. Don't quit. No matter how much work needs to be done, how far you feel from the Lord, how far you feel like you are from where God wants you to be, expect breakthrough. Expect breakthrough and keep doing the work. I uh, I came across uh, a couple of things that thought fit pretty good with this. It says, uh, so to all the brokenhearted, I say, take up your bed and walk and watch an army of dry bones rise up in your wake. As you get up and walk, as you move towards healing, as you move towards restoration that encourages and gives strength and power to other people to come behind you and have the courage to do the same thing. This other one, uh, uh, we were watching The Chosen the other night, and uh, there was this, uh, this quote. It said, I'm sorry for the shame and regret that you feel. Truly, it must be very painful. But Jesus forgave you and you choose to hold on to it. Jesus forgave you. Why do you choose to hang on to it? Why do you choose, why do we choose to hang on to the shame and the guilt and pain? That's us doing that. 
that's not from the Lord. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Over the next few weeks, we're going to see that everybody, regardless of where you are at, can experience breakthrough, and the Lord desires that for your life. We're going to look at people in the Gospels who experienced personal breakthrough that completely changed their life. We're going to see that no person, no mistake, no life is too far gone for our all-knowing, all-powerful, all-sufficient, forgiving Savior. Jesus can take life at whatever stage and make an example for his, of his forgiveness and his grace. Amen? God, we, uh, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the, the, the way that you are obviously already moving in our presence. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would continue to move. Would you continue to shape and change, burn away and scrape away the impurities pray that you would heal scars and wounds that we would run to you and to your loving and gracious and forgiving arms and not allow our mistakes, our our past, our, our sin to create distance between you and us, but rather the realization of those things would cause us to, uh, to run, to run to and to press into your presence even more. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, Peter, Peter's one of those characters in scripture that I think a lot of us can relate to Peter in, uh, in a lot of ways, some of us in ways that we would not like to admit, but, uh, but Peter, uh, Peter, Peter royally screwed up and I say that, um, kind of speaking about what uh, I, I probably could have said dot, 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 often. <laughs> Peter royally screwed up by denying Jesus. And in the story that we're going to look at today, he's standing before Jesus on the beach. Can you imagine what was going through Peter's mind? He's standing there. Jesus didn't scold him for messing up. Instead, he offers him forgiveness and restoration. John 21, 7 through 17. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, again, interesting uh, term that John gives himself here. <laughs> the disciple, the one uh, Jesus loved, said to Peter, it, it is the Lord. When, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off, and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. So again, uh, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of context and backstory here. The, the disciples are out fishing, and, uh, and they're not catching anything. They'd been fishing all night. And they're not catching anything. And uh, uh, this is the second time this has happened in their lives. Uh, they're not catching anything. And, uh, and so uh, there's, there's this figure on the, on the beach. And he says, hey, have you caught anything? That No, nah, we haven't caught anything. Cast your nets on the other side. Okay. So they cast their nets on the other side. Big haul of fish. So their nets are full. It says, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. 
So Simon Peter climbed up, uh, climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. This is an interesting interaction. <laughs> An interesting interaction, and I think uh, as Christians, this is a story that we should uh, we should review and we should process often. As Christians, I think many times we don't feel like we measure up to. Whatever standard we feel like, and we probably all have different standards that we, that we feel like we have to hold ourselves to, you know, whether that's having a pastor as a dad <laughs> with my kids as, as I was, you know, there's a standard I th we feel like we have to measure up to. And whether that's something that is, 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 is communicated by other people, I think sometimes is there unfairly. <laughs> or whether we put that on ourselves, sometimes we feel like we don't measure up or we don't please God. And the enemy loves it when we think this way. The enemy loves it when we think this way. He uses this kind of thinking to trap us and make us feel stuck. Like we're always trying to do better. We're always trying to be better. We're always trying to do more. We're always trying to be more. I think this story of Peter gives us hope. Peter's restoration gives us hope. God is not measuring us up. God is not measuring us up. The question of do we measure up has already been answered and the answer is a resounding no <laughs> you do not measure up that has already been settled so stop trying you do not measure up every one of us fall desperately short Romans 3 23 and 24 for all have sinned not some not most, all have sinned and fallen short of the standard, fallen short of the glory of God. And I love, I, I don't know, I didn't look up, I'll, I will admit, I didn't look up at the original language and the original context of this sentence, or not context, uh, construction of this sentence, and I don't know what, when it was written in, in, in the Greek here, I don't know what Greek punctuations looked like. I don't know what that all looked like, but it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and there is not a period there. There is a semicolon. Do you know what a semicolon means? It means it could have ended. The sentence could have ended, but the author continued to move on. Continued 
The author continued. There's not a period there. There is a semicolon. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God, right? It continues. It doesn't end there. That is exciting. That is good news for us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely. Those who have sinned, all of us, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes in Christ Jesus. It's this is the condition, but there's a cure. That's what's being communicated here. We don't measure up, so stop trying. There's so much freedom when we stop trying. He wants to free you from that. He wants to free you from trying because you will never measure up. But God, they are justified freely. Nothing that you have to do. You have to do nothing freely. It's a free gift of God. Freely by his grace. And that justification comes through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. New has come. Stop living in the old. It's gone. It's dead. New life. That's what he came to bring us. Offer us. Biblical Jesus saved us from having to measure up. Christ fulfilled all of the requirements of the law because we couldn't. And in salvation, Christ gives us his righteousness in exchange for our sinfulness. Please do not ever let this fact fail to get you excited. This is the greatest of exchanges for us. Again, we come out so much better in this exchange. We get the better end of the deal. Peter is at the end of his rope. <laughs> He's messed up really, really bad. He's messed up really bad. I'm sure he felt like he couldn't get any lower. He had just finished ad, uh, adamantly saying. <laughs> In fact, he was, he was probably offended that Jesus would even suggest that he would deny him. He just finished adamantly saying he would not betray Jesus. And he ends up doing the exact thing. It's exactly what he does. He denies ever knowing Jesus. He doesn't do it one time. He does it three times. <laughs> he denies ever knowing Jesus. And then he takes it farther. And he calls down curses on the people who are asking him if he was with Jesus or if he knew Jesus. And he not only denied his friend, but he denied God himself. He screwed up pretty bad. And filled with shame and hopelessness, I'm sure we can imagine what Peter was feeling. Shame and hopelessness, Peter goes back to what he knew. He went back to what was comfortable. He went back to fishing. He went back to who he was before Jesus called him. Probably still feeling pretty bad. He's with the other disciples at this point. There's other disciples in the boat with him, they're fishing. And I wonder if it, <clears throat> at some point they told each other, 
from their point of view what happened. I wonder if they told each other their stories, maybe asking each other where they went and what they did in those hours after Jesus was arrested. You know, when you get together with friends and reconnect and especially in a, in a situation like this where something unbelievable had ju has just happened. Where were you? You know, we, we talk about uh, sometimes when we look back at 9-11. At where were you when you first heard the news? Where were you when you turned on the TV and saw towers and smoke? Katie and I, I was, <laughs> I was skipping class in college. <laughs> Katie was at work. I was skipping. I, I, I think I intended to go to class, and then that was on, and I, 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 I used that as an excuse to, to stay home. Where were you? What were you feeling? What were you, you know, I'm sure some of these conversations happened. Did Peter tell his embarrassing side of the story? That's one I would have wanted to keep to myself. <laughs> Maybe you tell part of the story, but not the, not the embarrassing. That's, that's one of the things. That's actually one of the things that, that proves the, the authenticity of Scripture. It's because if I was writing this story and it was all made up, I would not put these embarrassing things about myself in, in this. this is, you make yourself look good when you're writing a story, right? If, if you're making it up and you're... No, they clearly don't. One of the things that authenticates scripture for us. Did they know what he had done? Peter hears the voice of Jesus, and Peter, never being one to hold back, he lays it all out there. Here's the voice of Jesus, and he puts on his coat and he swims to shore. Now I want you to think honestly, and I don't, I'm not looking for a show of hands, but how many of you honestly can say that this would be your reaction? I'm not sure my first reaction would be to want to go and see Jesus after what I had just done. When we fail God, it, 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 many times our, our first instinct is to want to create distance, to distance ourselves from his presence rather than run to it. It's in our nature, right? It's Adam and Eve's first response, isn't it? Is to run and hide. It's in our nature. You ever had an awkward interaction with somebody? I know that you have. Um, had an awkward interaction with someone and then run into them not long after. What do you say? Who starts the conversation? Thinking of a, of a kid who slams his door, storms away and slams his door, his or her door on their parents. Austin's laughing right now <laughs> with a smile on his face. Uh, slams his or her door and later on has to eat at the same table with the parents. An employer or a supervisor who has to reprimand an employee and then runs into them later at the grocery store. Spouse who just blew up at their husband or wife and has to interact with them because they live in the same house. Peter finds himself in a similar type of situation. He sees Jesus again. It's the first recorded um, interaction, kind of a, a personal interaction between Jesus and Peter since then. Jesus had appeared to them two other times, but it was kind of, they were kind of brief, uh, at least according to what we know from Scripture. They seem to be very brief uh, interactions. He, he shows up, and, and they're, they're praying, and he shows up and, and reveals himself, but Thomas isn't there. And so then later, Thomas is there, and he, he, he's in the, in, the, in the room again, and we see uh, Thomas touching his hands and, and, his, and the wounds in his, his body, and, and then he's gone again. So they're kind of brief interactions. This is the first recorded interaction that we have, uh, kind of a personal interaction with Jesus and Peter. 
this, the one who had just uh, betrayed Jesus, who would start the conversation? What would Jesus say? What would Peter say? Peter stands in front of Jesus, probably expecting to be reprimanded or chastised or corrected, dripping wet in all of his guilt and shame and brokenness and dysfunction and discouragement. Were Jesus' first words, I told you so. (laughs) I told you so. Peter didn't get a scolding. Jesus didn't shove his finger in Peter's chest and give him the what for. He didn't revoke Peter's disciple card. Did Jesus embarrass him in front of the others, making an example of him, showing them how not to be his follower? Because that was exactly (laughs) that. I'm glad I'm not Jesus, right? In verse 10, Jesus tells the disciples to get the fish that they caught. In verse 12, he asks them to join him in eating breakfast that is already prepared. There's already, the meal's already cooking. It says there's fish and bread already already on the fire. Breakfast that he'd already prepared for them. And again, can you imagine what, what Peter is thinking? Are we not going to talk about this? Is Jesus so mad that he can't even talk to me right now? Or maybe he forgot. Maybe he doesn't remember. (laughs) Bible doesn't record if there was a conversation or if it was just awkward silence. (laughs) But one thing we do see is that Jesus serves his disciples. He serves them breakfast. He prepares a meal for them. And then after what might have been a silent meal together, I don't know if they were just all kind of staring at their food and there was no talking. Jesus asks Peter in verse 15, do you love me? Now what we, what we know from scripture as we, as we read in scripture so far, Jesus has done all the talking. And from this interaction, it becomes clear that Jesus forgives Peter, forgave him. This is absolutely a breakthrough in Peter's life. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask Peter if he loved him? Three times. breakthrough. It's a breakthrough in Peter's life. The next next time we see Peter specifically is in Acts 2 and he's preaching to thousands of people. The Holy Spirit had come. It's almost as if you can you can put a pin on this interaction and, 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 and this, this moment in Peter's life as the, a moment when he said, I'm done with everything else. From this moment forward, I'm all in. Whatever it takes, I'll go wherever and say whatever. And this breakthrough is possible or it's spurred on or it's, it's the, the catalyst for that is the fact that, that Jesus didn't give Peter a shaming 
He didn't shame Peter. Doesn't even say he said, you know, Peter, ah, that hurt, man. <laughs> ah, that was, that was rough. That was rough. You're supposed to be my man, my main guy. Ugh, if I could count on anybody, I thought it was you. Doesn't put guilt on Peter. Doesn't put shame on Peter. He restores him in spite of Peter's very obvious failures. He gave him grace and restoration, redemption and reconciliation, a second chance. Jesus rescued him from himself, from his discouragement and from his failure. Peter's sin had already beat him, had beat him up enough. I mean, you imagine being, again, He's pro I can imagine, he's probably hiding this fact from the other disciples. I don't know if they knew, I don't know. But he's beating himself up. We know that because as soon as he denied him a third time and the rooster crowed, what does, it, what does it say Peter did? It said he ran away weeping. Not just weeping, it says weeping bitterly. Peter knew he screwed up doesn't need anyone to tell him how badly he screwed up because he already knew. He'd been beating himself up, I'm sure, since that rooster crowed that third time. What he needs at this point is a savior to pick him back up and put hope back into his future. I think there are some of us who need that. You need to be picked up and for there to be hope put back into your future. And the same Jesus that did that for Peter is waiting to do that for you. But just like Peter did, he had to leave what he went back to and come to Jesus. We all struggle and we all fail. And the struggle is proof, evidence that we are so in desperate need of biblical Jesus. When we fail, we go to a lot of different things. We do a lot of different things. What do you do when you fail? What do you turn to? Some people turn to binge watching shows, your favorite show or whatever it is to to uh, to drown out or or uh, move your attention away from or to ignore your sorrow and shame. Some people go to their friends who tell them exactly what they want to hear, maybe to to justify our sin. Others beat themselves up over their sin. Some turn to other things. Some turn to drugs or alcohol. And heartbreakingly, some, like was Judas' response to his failure, turn to suicide because they feel like there is no hope. There's a lack of hope. After we're done with this series, we're going to talk about hope. Talk about struggles that we have, mental illnesses, and how, how, do, we, how do we get hope? How do we, how do we move forward? How do we get counseling? What, is, what does that look like? I think the church has done a very poor job of talking about these issues, and we just kind of skirt them aside and don't talk about them. Judas's response. These are not the answers. These responses are not the answers. The only answer, listen to this, the only answer and cure for our failure is the love, grace, and forgiveness that Jesus offers. It's the only cure. It's the only thing that will suffice. It was, it's the only thing that will heal. 
He was enough at the moment of your salvation, and he is enough to forgive us now inside of our current needing of saving. (laughs) He was enough then, and he is enough now. His power, write this down, or listen to this. His power to forgive and save is not diminished in any way by the magnitude of your failure or my failure. His power to forgive, okay? We, sometimes we go, yeah, he can save me. He, he saved me. He did. His power to forgive you. If we confess our sins, he might be faithful enough to forgive us. He is <laughs> faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins. Oh, but not mine. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the thoughts I've thought. You don't know the things that I've done that that nobody knows. You're right, I don't. (laughs) He does, and he loves you and forgives you anyway. His power to forgive and save is not diminished in any way by the magnitude of of your failure or my failure. When we mess up, when we sin, religion says this. Oh man, I've messed up. My dad is going to kill me. Like Adam and Eve did, they hide in the we hide in the garden relationship and understanding of who our gracious and loving and forgiving God is. In that relationship, that relationship says, oh man, I've messed up. I need to go see my dad. That's the relationship that God desires to have with us. Instead of running and hiding, we come and freely confess and freely receive the forgiveness and the restoration that he offers. So here we are, like Peter, dripping wet in our denial, in our dysfunction, in our discouragement, and in our failures. We are completely undeserving and incapable of saving ourselves. And here he is, completely victorious over our sin undeservingly gracious toward our shame and disappointment. Totally compassionate, calling us back into amazing grace and love. His amazing grace and love. Restoration. I would have loved to have seen and heard whatever the conversation as the disciples walk off that beach and go on to whatever they did next. But I have to imagine it was a very different atmosphere than the one that was present when they are on the boat fishing. Peter experienced a breakthrough because of the forgiveness of our God. Today could be your breakthrough day, just as it was for Peter when he re-encountered Jesus. I, my, our hope and our prayer is that as we've looked at reconnecting, refocusing our hearts over the last few weeks, that you have re-encountered Jesus And that breakthrough is taking place or will continue to take place in your life. And our prayer here at Central Church is that we would all re-encounter biblical Jesus. And that we would all expect breakthrough in our lives. Because of his unconditional love and undeserving grace. 
because of these things that we would be more committed and more devoted than ever to carrying out our call individually and corporately of loving and taking the gospel to others who need breakthrough. You are not the only one who needs breakthrough. You're not the only one who needs to re-encounter Jesus. You're not the only one who needed to encounter Jesus for the first time. There are thousands and thousands of people who have not encountered biblical Jesus, who have not had the life-changing experience of standing before Jesus soaking wet in our sin and our shame and experiencing the life-changing forgiveness that Peter experienced, that some of you have already experienced. We are called as the church to communicate this life-changing possibility to other people, and that's only through a relationship with Jesus. You carry that good news with you. There are other people who need, desperately need, not just want, but desperately need this good news that you carry. I've said it before, I will say it a thousand times. How selfish of us to keep that to ourselves. He did a work in you so that you can keep it to yourself and just sit on it. He did a work in you so that that would multiply, that would spread to other people. Amen? Amen. If you would like prayer, if you need a breakthrough in your life, I think we all do. We would love to pray with you. God's just waiting for us to come to him and stand before him humbly and repentant. He's willing and ready to forgive. And then, just like Peter, he wants to do incredible, miraculous things through you. Amen? So if you would like that prayer, there are going to be some people up here that would love to, love to pray with you. Sometimes we feel like we have to battle on our own. <laughs> Go, oh man, I just really been praying and I don't see any. And I'm just, I'll, yeah, I'll just, I'll just continue to pray on my own and I'll just continue to, to struggle through this on my own. And we, this is that, that this is what this is for. <laughs> we come alongside each other. We carry each other's burdens. We lift each other up. In prayer, we battle together. Right. Amen. That's something that, that you would desire. We'd love, to, we'd love to battle with you this morning. Father, we, uh, we're incredibly grateful for the undeserving grace and mercy that, that you extend to us. Father, would you allow that to be more present, more often uh, uh, brought to the front of our minds and Help us not to lose the weight of the fact that we've offended you in the most grievous of ways and we're undeserving of being restored. We've walked away from you and denied you so many times, just like Peter did. And uh, Thank you for the example of Peter's life. Thank you for the example here in this story of uh, the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus that you offered. The example of uh, the breakthrough that we see in the, as we look at the rest of Peter's life and the way that this moment changed him. Reinst being reinstated. God, you continue to use Peter even after his failures, and you desire to continue to use us even after our many failures. And this is just an awesome thing, awesome fact. So we come before you just grateful, humbly expressing to you our, uh, uh, our faults and our failures and uh, 
thank you that you lovingly take us back. And Father, I'm praying this morning that, uh, that as we start this series, uh, we look at breakthrough in people's lives. I pray uh, that breakthrough would take place in the lives of people in this body, that breakthrough would take place in Jesus' name in the, the, uh, the, the lives of people in this community. Father, I pray for other churches right now in this area that there would be breakthrough, that your Holy Spirit would flood these other churches in this community, that there would be a revival and that that would start with your people humbly coming before you in repentance. And that even if those things are not happening in this room, uh, we, are a, we are a whole body of believers, the other, the other churches that are in this area, and uh, I pray that revival would, uh, would come in this body, in, uh, in the other churches that are meeting this morning, Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to fill those places, fill uh, the buildings, uh, Father, that... Uh, that it would be undeniable that you're moving and that peop- the people would prepare themselves, that we would prepare ourselves for what you're going to do in 2023. And be, we are expectant to see breakthrough in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.